How did you come back as Glacier? Moved, got a teaching job in the summer of 1990. Um, one of the first things I did was go and, and uh, get a membership at uh, Main Event Fitness, which was Lex and Sting's gym. And, and it wasn't too far from where I got an apartment. And that's where everybody from WCW worked out, you know? I mean, everybody, the Steiners, Dallas, everybody that lived in Atlanta pretty much worked out there uh, if they lived in that area. And um, and when the wrestlers came into to town, if they didn't live there, that's where they went and worked out, you know. And um, and so, you know, I, I, but even as I got to know Dallas through Disco, Disco was the one that really kind of helped me um, forge those friendships. And, um, uh, you know, and, and eventually I, I you know, and Dallas was working his way up at that time, too, you know. But it was eventually, you know, I Dallas saw my work ethic. He saw, you know, the way I carry myself. He saw everything that I was doing. You know, it was more like. I always say, you know, well done is better than well said, you know, and he saw that I was doing the work, not just talking about doing the work. And, um, and eventually, you know, funny that, you know, uh, Disco actually came up with the, uh, the coach Buzz Stern thing I did for a while, you know, when they were, they were changing of the guard happened in WCW, <clears throat> that Disco came up with that, that, uh, really? that name. And, yeah. uh, um, and we pitched coach Buzz Stern, Dallas pitched that to Bischoff before, even before the Glacier thing was really even conceived. And, uh, and he was, he was kind of lukewarm on it. He was like, ah, but at that point, the coaching had been done a couple of times. And, and in my opinion, it was not done really well because the people who did it were not real coaches. They didn't really, you know, they, they didn't really know kind of how I feel how to do it. Though, right. So, so that kind of got put on the shelf. But once again, I was still, I was plugging away at the Indies. There was a big show, a TV show up in Atlanta called North Georgia wrestling that aired every Saturday night, right in the middle of all of the, um, it was a TV 34 and there was like five or six hours of, of wrestling that ran on Saturday night and this local promotion, they worked with the TV station and they, they had a spot right in the middle of that. So even though, and, and everybody, me, Disco, Bagwell, Scotty Riggs, um, a lot of the other guys, we all worked that show, made no money, I mean, $10 a show, right. <laughs> but, but we're on Atlanta TV. So, you know, that was a lot of good exposure. So eventually, um, uh, Dallas, and uh, found out that, uh, you know, that I somehow he didn't really even understand that I did the martial arts stuff. And uh, so he found out about that right around Christmas of 95. And uh, um, he ended up telling Eric about that. Eric, that's what piqued Eric's interest. And then that right after the holidays, um, Eric said, hey, I want to meet with him after the holidays. So it was right around that first week of January, if, if I remember correctly. There was a little restaurant right by their neighborhood. And they actually did live about three houses from each other <laughs> and uh, Dallas and uh, Bischoff. And um I, I went and met with him and we had what I remember to be about a three hour dinner <laughs> and, and to me seemed like an eternity, but, um, but, you know, he really grilled me a lot on, and not, not grilled me. We just had a conversation, but a lot of about the martial arts world, cause he was really that. And I think a lot of it was to make sure that I was who I said I was, you know, as far as knowing all the martial right. arts. And I, and he saw pretty quickly that I knew all the people he was talking about. I knew. And so in that three hour conversation or close to three hour conversation at the end of it, he basically, you know, offered me a deal, you know, at the end of it. And uh, I had never expected, I, I never went, had expected that in that moment, but I can say this, Mike, that uh, it's what I always say when I, when I do seminars and stuff is like, you know, is you have to know in your heart, you're ready. So if you're going to, if you're going to knock on people's door at that level and say, Hey, give me a shot, give me a shot. You have to know in your heart, you're ready, you know? And, and I knew I was ready. I, I maybe, even a few years before then, I first five years, of my, and it, but it still took me nine years, you know, to get that to that point right. without get that break. First, probably five years, I, I I could say, I don't think I was ready, you know, but once I knew I was ready, I knew I was ready, you know, and, and I, I, I hope that Eric since that in, that in that meeting and um, yeah, and that point I was, I was actually, I'd left teaching and I was actually um, athletic director of the Atlanta athletic club, which is very distinguished country club in Atlanta. My other mentor um, who I met, about the time that I met my martial arts instructor, this guy Chip Smith, um, uh, I was working with Chip. He was, uh, I was the fitness director. Chip was the athletic director. And um, so I had a really good job, you know, very, very distinguished job where I was around a lot of high profile people that could open a lot of doors for me. And so even Eric said, you don't even have to quit your job right now. Just, uh, he said, just disappear from the wrestling, indie wrestling scene, right. <laughs> independent wrestling scene. We didn't even call it indie wrestling scene. <laughs> but, um, and I told him, I said, I can do that. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. so I did, I disappeared and, and that started the wheels in motion of forming what would later, and it took months to get, but we hired AFX studios under my recommendation. Um, cause I knew the guy at the head of that and, and they started the forming of, of the, you know, creating Glacier and then creating Mortis and, and then Raft and of course Ernest. Ray, how did that entrance come 
to be? Did you have to practice it? Was it at the power plant? Was it at live yeah. events? Like, how did you first practice that entrance? You know what, my, um, that's a really great question. And you know what, I don't, I don't ever remember anybody really asking me that question. That's a great question. Uh, we, we practiced a lot of the power plant as far as the mannerisms of, of Glacier and, and all this stuff. Um, and then eventually, if I remember correctly, um, you know, we would, um, I would start going to some shows that were close by, you know, that weren't where they wouldn't really necessarily have to fly me out or whatever. And, um, I, and kind of we start i'd start working with the the, the um of course keith mitchell was our producer uh and keith's legendary producer in the wrestling business just retired uh, uh well-deserved retirement but he he was he did all of impact wrestling all those years after wcw he did a and a and a and a a and a and a w i helped until he retired last year but um you know just laying it out we first just started kind of walking through it in the arena like okay what well, if we're going to have lasers how are we going to have lasers and then they they figured out that they could have these round mirror discs on the floor. And then it's because that could travel. They could break that down. So if you, if you ever go back and watch any of my entrances like that first year, if you look, if you see the lasers, if you look around, like if after cameras or after the late, the stop, the entrance has stopped, you look around, you'll see these just, you know, and the thing about dangerous that was, there's these <laughs> mirror yeah. discs on the floor that easily could be stepped on or broken, you know, during the match. I I remember when we worked, you said, remember? When, you, when, when you outside, you said, don't look directly at the lasers. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. You gave me that instruction before you yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, because uh, I was like, you know, we don't, we don't all, it's hard enough. We don't all need to go blind out here. <laughs> but, uh, but no, it was, um, so we laid it out and they, they practiced it. And then, and then what they did was, um, then we took it to, to uh, I was on the last taping that we did at um, Hollywood Studios, MGM, it was MGM at the time, you know, down in Orlando, where they had a deal there first and then eventually switched to Universal. But um, so they tested it there, like in the studios, they tested on a smaller scale. And then, because, um, you know, like, even though the, the studio was smaller, the ringside setup is about, that stays about the same if you just right. drop it into a bigger arena. So they Big stuff there. They, they kind of figured out how much was enough snow and not too much snow, which sometimes it was a lot of snow. <laughs> and sometimes it was a lot of snow in like one area. You know? and of course it, <laughs> sometimes it's a like, blizzard. Yeah, sometimes yeah, it's it flurries. <laughs> oh, and it, and it was at first it was like the soapy stuff where, you know, it just get yeah. all over me and then it'd get on the canvas and it'd be where the paint was and it'd be real slippery. And so, um, yeah, but but eventually it was like anything else. You know, we, we, we started started slow. And you know, you just kept kept tweaking it and tweaking it and tweaking it, and finally, finally, we got it. But uh, but I was, I tell you what, I mean, I, I'm still to this day so honored and thrilled that that I was the person who got to be Glacier, and and I'm still, you know, and and you know, that's the funny thing is that because um, we do the you know with the with the camps and stuff, and I do the seminars, and it's funny how people, uh, you know, the younger kids now who weren't even alive when I was, you know, on TV in, in the mid '90s, which uh, Makes me feel and sound old, but, uh, but, um, you know, they'll go on social media and they'll still read stuff and they're like, oh, coach, like, you know, so and so, they, they just, they just really put the boots to the whole glacier thing. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know what? That means I'm in pretty good company, you know, because, <laughs> because, you know, they got, got if, during Cena's, you know, at the height of his career, half the arena was booing him, you know, and I said, you know, you just, here's the thing, you know, I always go back to what Eddie Grail said me one time because I, I really, I, there's one time, most of the time it never bothered me really, but there's one time it got under my skin a little bit. I just remember, and I've always remembered this, is Eddie Guerrero, because Eddie was coming, at, he was trying to break through that, that um, you know, kind of uh, where they were, you know, not purposely, but they were not going to give Eddie that spot because they felt like he wasn't a big guy, you know? And uh, and Eddie, everybody knows Eddie was just amazing, you know, as a person and as a performer and, and a wrestler. But uh, I just remember him coming up to me one time, putting his hand on my shoulder and saying, Ray, just remember those guys won't ever sign your paycheck, you know. <laughs> he said. Yeah. He said, and if, if the people in the office are still paying you, then you're doing stuff right, you know. And uh, and and you know, and and you know, as well as I embrace it all, and and, and you know, you're gonna have. There's a lot of critics out there, but I tell you what, it's like anything else. A thousand people can tell you how how great your performance was. That one who says you suck, that's the one that keeps you up at night, you know. <laughs> right. but, you know, but but it just rolled up because I. In the, almost 30 years now, I've been I've had the honor to be Glacier. It has been a great ride, and I wouldn't change it for the world. I really wouldn't have them. Because the, 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 all the positive and negative stuff, they they, they form you into who you are, you know? <laughs> so, sure. well, what about the locker room? Like you're coming in. You're coming in with a big push. Yeah. Your, cost, your costume probably cost 
more than oh, some yeah. of the guys were making that yeah. year. Oh, yeah, the snow yeah. cost money, the lasers, all that stuff cost a lot of money. How yeah. did the locker room treat you at first? I, um, you know, that was one of the things where I remember Dallas telling me, uh, well, first of all, I, you know, I had nine years of experience. And at that point, I'd gone to Japan. Uh, I had met Luthez, you know, kind of befriended him. Um, I had, uh, you know, I had those guys like Bullet Bob, Wrestling 2, guys who, who, who really, in my opinion, were class act guys in the business who, who really knew what it meant how to be a professional, you know, and, and they, you know, coached me really well on what to expect and how to conduct myself. So I did like, like any, any smart person in that spot with him. When I came in, I was very humble. I went around and introduced myself to everybody and I found a corner and I went, I sat in that corner and waited until they came and asked me what I, what told me, Hey, go here, you know? And, um, but I didn't, when I say I would sit and wait in the corner, I, I would still be sociable. Cause like I said, at that time, a lot of the guys that were in WCW, I kind of already knew because they, a lot of them lived in Atlanta. So I'd kind of, you know, pardon the pun, broken the ice already a little bit, you know, <laughs> with them. And, uh, and it was, um, it was, yeah, but, but I remember there was some resentment. It was, there was, um, <clears throat> and it wasn't, I don't remember anybody specifically, but you know, as well as I do in the rest of the business, you can feel that when it's in the air, you know, and you're in the arena, you can feel it when you're walking around, you can feel when there's resentment towards fair or not. Usually it's not fair, but, <clears throat> but you can feel when there's that, those eyes on you, you know, because, oh, who's this guy? Who does he think he is? What's he doing here? My buddy should have gotten that push, you know, whatever, you know, or that spot, you know, you can feel it. And I remember feeling it at one point and I remember Dallas, you know, I went to Dallas and I said, uh, Cause Dallas was never bashful, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I just remember Dallas singing, which just meant so much to me at the time. He just said, and I would go to Dallas a lot. I, you know, I, he's, I always say Dallas is like my crazy big brother, but, uh, um, he just, I remember saying like, man, like, you know, I'm sure there's some guys here that, you know, would love to, you know, uh, for me to not be in this spot. And he just, I remember him saying, yeah, he said, but you know what? One of the main reasons you're in this spot is because you can handle that kind of, you know, stuff you can handle that you know he didn't use that word he used the more specific word that Dallas would use but, but you know he right. just said like like we know that you can handle that kind of pressure you can handle that type of situation and um and you know thankfully thankfully I have a hopefully a, a welcome inviting personality where I feel like I'm you know I try to make myself very approachable you know and and I and once again I I, I it's like I tell I guess I go back to the, I, know, I know you like me we, we give you know as much advice to the young minds who will listen, you know, and I tell them all like, look, it's the things that you would do in pro wrestling to, <clears throat> to make yourself present yourself in, in, in the way you should is what you would do in any other professional setting. Right. You know, if you go on the, if you, if you're there for the first time in, at a promotion, it doesn't take too long to figure out who the established people are in that promotion. Like in, if you were first day in an office, okay, you can figure out pretty quick who the established people are. It's if you want to get off on the right foot, take the responsibility to take the initiative to go introduce yourself to them, you know, because that's going to, it's going to be impressive to them, you know, rather than just sit back and I always say fair or not. Some of my favorite terms to use in the wrestling business, fair or not. If you don't do that, there are going to be people in our industry that automatically put an X against you because they say, Oh, he came in there and he, he must've thought he was, you know, somebody big. He didn't come over and talk to anybody. He just sat around and stared at the wall the whole time. Yeah. You know? And right. you know, that, that's maybe not fair, but that's, and that person may have a lot of power with whoever is going to be booking you or not booking you next, you know, and, or a lot of say so, you know, and, and I just say, you know, it's the good, good etiquette in pro wrestling is pretty much good professional etiquette that you would do anywhere, you know, and, but yeah. it's being, being lost, unfortunately, you know, um, yeah. you know and, and, uh, but, um, but it can be learned. It can be learned at any time, you know, so it's never too late to, to, to learn that. Just, you know, we, I mean, the younger generation has grown up with, you know, faces buried in this, you know, and, right. and I get it, I get it, but you're going to stand out, you know, among, uh, uh, amongst all the people you're competing with. If you, if you can do that, I mean, and, and, and you're willing to do that. And, and, uh, and it doesn't take much. It's just like anything else. Just practice it, practice it. A little bit. You know? So, right. but it's one of the things I have to tell so many people. It's just, you know, get your face out from being buried in your phone, look people in the eye, offer a handshake, introduce yourself. You know, it's, it sounds easy. I know it's probably terrifying, but it gets easier and easier the more you do it. 